Thanks for coming to the last of these four lectures on, on the DOZZ formula. So today uh, uh, I'm going to, to, uh, to give a sketch of the proof of the, of the DOZZ formula uh, uh, that, I, that, I, you know, I, I, that I explained. So I explained the DOZZ formula in the first lectures, but I'm going to re-explain uh, exactly what we prove. Uh, there are some new faces, so I think that if I, I give a, a few uh, reminders, it, it, it will be useful to, well, I guess, to, to all of us. Okay, so um, let me start, first start by, I, I wrote it already, I cheated. Uh, let me recall what the, the DOZZ formula is. Okay, so it's a rather complicated function. Uh, so uh, remember, so uh, what we did is we introduced in the first lecture a probabilistic expression using the Gaussian free field for the endpoint correlation functions of, of Liouville conformal field theory. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to prove that uh, the three-point correlation function of Liouville conformal field theory is given by the DOZZ formula, that our probabilistic construction matches this formula that physicists derived uh, you know, in a, in a non-rigorous way. And um, so let me recall, so we see it at least once in these lectures, <laughs> written on the board. So what is the DOZZ formula? It says that the three-point correlation function of, of Liouville, uh, so we saw, and I'm going to recall in a few, in a few, uh, in a few, well, maybe before stating the DOZZ, let me, let me recall what we did in lecture one. So in lecture one, we defined the three-point correlation, the endpoint correlation function for n greater or equal to three. We defined so if I take points here belonging to the complex plane, and I take weights alpha k, which uh, are going to satisfy some bounds that we call the extended Seiberg bounds, we define an endpoint correlation function by 2, so mu. So mu is a positive parameter, which plays no role in the theory. It's, a, it's just something, it's a theory that is scale invariant, if you wish. So to the power minus s, gamma of s, so I'll, I'll tell you in a, a moment what is S with respect to the weights. I'll recall this. So expectation of, <coughs> so I, 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 I think I'm, I'm going to, I wrote it like this. Okay, integral over the complex plane of some function, which depends, you know, on all the points to the power minus s, and let me say what these things are. So s is related to the weights. It's the sum of the weights minus 2q over gamma. So the Liouville theory depends on two parameters, the essential parameter gamma, you know, which controls you know, all the conformal invariance properties, and mu, the so-called positive cosmological constant. So gamma belongs to 0, 2 in these lectures. We could take it up to two. Mu is some, you know, positive parameter, whatever. Okay, and what is this? Oh, and I forgot one term, which is the truth. Sorry, but well, let me make a little bit of room. Product for i smaller than j, one over z a, z i minus z j, alpha i alpha j. Okay, and times this expectation. So what we're taking is a moment, so a fractional moment, of the exponential of the free field integrated against the function. So recall what the measure was. It was nothing but the exponential of the free field x Okay, that I integrate against So uh, some background measure. Now remember that this, this stands for the maximum of the Euclidean norm of x and of 1. OK. And what do I, uh, I integrate against this exponential of the free field? I integrate some function which has singularities on the points here, zk. And the, the magnitude of, of the singularity, you know, is, is, is given by these weights alpha k. 
So f of x, so uh, z, is the product for k equal 1 to n, x plus, sorry, x plus divided by x minus z k to the power gamma alpha k. Okay. So, I, so this was the probabilistic expression now of our Liouville correlation functions and these correlations exist provided the alpha k, so z k are distinct points in the complex plane and provided alpha k satisfies some bounds which are written in the notes which were in lecture one which are called the extended Seiberg bounds this quantity exists is non-trivial and is our clean probabilistic definition of Liouville, the Liouville correlation functions. Okay, now if you want, now in particular, so the condition n greater or equal to three came from the fact that the extended Seiberg bounds give constraints on the alpha k's, and these constraints force n to be greater or equal to three. Okay, so I'm not rewriting the the the. The, the, the extended Seiberg bounds, I'll write them probably when I look at the three-point function. Now, from this, I, I can look at the three-point correlation function when one point is sent and it's at infinity, right? Now, if I do this, so what I do is I introduce what is called the three-point structure constant or, you know, the three-point correlation function where, where one point is infinity. So, so I can introduce, so this was my three-point structure constant, or maybe a, a, an even better notation, which is not in the notes, but would be, it's to write this. Okay. And it's defined as the limit when Z3 goes to infinity of Z3 to some power for delta 3, the three-point correlation function. Z3. Okay, so I take the correlation function with points 0, 1, Z3. I, I renormalize by some factor, so this was the conformal way. Okay, so delta 3 is alpha 3 over 2, Q minus alpha 3 over 2. Oh, so let me, for those who, okay, I see there's a new face, so let me just recall that Q and gamma are related by this special relation. If I take this scaling limit, I get something non-trivial, and I get a, a probabilistic expression. And what is my probabilistic expression? It's 2 mu. So I'm going to set some notation into stone here. I'm going to introduce alpha bar, which is nothing but the sum of alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. So I just take the limit in my general expression, OK, um, minus. alpha bar minus 2q over gamma, okay, and I get expectation of, so I called it in the notes, rho alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 to the power of minus alpha bar 2q over gamma, where, so here I, I'm just copying basically what I have there. Let me, let me write it properly. Alpha bar is the sum. Okay, so this is, will be my notation during these two-hour lectures. And my random variable here, rho alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, it's nothing but, okay, then, alpha to the power alpha bar, the sum. And I have my singularities. And I'm integrating against the exponential of the free field. Okay, so let me. Okay, so this this, this looks correct. Okay, so I can define my three-point correlation function. I get a, a, a clean probabilistic expression, and provided okay, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three satisfies some bounds. This exists and is a non-trivial uh, definition of uh, my, my three-point correlation. Now the the DOZZ theorem says that this guy here, so. So this is, okay, this is an easy term. This is uh, the gamma function, so this is explicit. Um, so if I take this times this expectation with respect to the, the exponential of the free field that I'm integrating, then this thing is equal to the formula that is upstairs, the DOZZ formula. And what is the DOZZ formula? 
So I wrote it explicitly at least once in these lectures. So you see it's a, it's a rather intriguing and mysterious formula when you look at it at first. So it's, not, so it's pi mu times so L. So this L function is also set in stone in these notes. You know, it's the ratio of gamma over gamma 1 minus the variable. So I take this L function to this power here. Uh, and, uh, and, it's, and especially there's, there's the ratio of four epsilon functions. So these are called the Zamolochikov's epsilon functions, divided by four epsilon functions. And these epsilon functions of Zamolochikov have an explicit expression. It's exponential of this, you know, this, this integral here, uh, with, uh, so where z is a parameter. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to try to explain how you prove that uh, this guy upstairs, which is you know, just some fractional moment, essentially, is equal to this uh, rather complicated formula. OK? So that's the plan. So it, it's the main, uh <coughs> OK. All right. So, um, Let me, uh, I've, so I've written this formula, so they're in the notes, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to erase it now, if, if, if you allow me. It was just to show it once, and, uh, and I'm rather going to explain why this formula ha is so special, okay? Essentially, I'm going to explain that this formula, it satisfies a unique system of functional equations. And that's by, and these functional equations that, th that this formula satisfies, well, they, they stem from this special property of the epsilon, Zamolochikov epsilon function. So remember L, L of Z is gamma Z over gamma 1 minus Z. And you, you may just leave it. You want me to leave this formula? OK. So, you, so I leave it. So I'm going to leave this too. Okay, so these two are these two guys. These two guys, sorry, are the same. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do? So okay, I'm going to, I'm going to. So you see, when I shift, this is a shift equation. If I shift my variable in my epsilon, Zamolochikov's epsilon function, I get the same thing times a ratio of gamma functions. Okay, essentially up to some power, and the same thing for this guy. I get a, the dual equation. Okay, and. This is really what characterizes Zamolochikov's epsilon function. And, it, and, it, and, and so if you use these two functional relations, then you're going to deduce functional relations on the DOZZ formula. So this is what I'm going to, to write. Um, OK, I, I wrote it here. Now, one has the following. One can show the following thing. So I take DOZZ. And I shift the variable by gamma over 2, OK? And I get the following equation, minus 1 over pi mu. Some function, I'm going to, uh, so it's a curly A or a matcal A if you're doing, minus gamma over 2 times the same thing. OK, and I, I'll say in a moment what this function is. And I have the same dual equation. Well, not quite. So there's some subtlety here. So I have that when I shift my variable, so I have to introduce the dual cosmological constant. OK? Gamma. Where? So the dual cosmological constant is not mu. So remember, mu is just my parameter up there, which is in factor. It's uh, mu pi, my L function, my ratio of gamma functions. Um, OK. 
And so if alpha 0 belongs to minus gamma over 2 minus 2 over gamma, so it's one of the two values here, what is worth a? So it's a rather complicated expression, but I'm nonetheless going to write it. So it's a ratio of lots of these L functions. So I'm writing it really explicitly. Of course, you know, in this business, that may be Zamoru I I don't know if someone knows these formulas <laughs> without notes. Okay. It's a rather complicated expression. So I'm sorry, this, it's, uh, I really want to write, write down these expressions so things, so I don't, you know, do a too abstract discussion. I really want you to see at least once the, the formulas. Okay, so L is the ratio of two gamma. Okay, so DOZZ satisfies uh, these two shift equations here. Okay, so so how does the proof go? Um, the proof, well, the idea of the proof is to show that this guy here, this guy here satisfies the same shift equations up there. Okay? So, of course, by conformal invariance, the three-point function, it's, it, uh, you know, it's, it's invariant if I, I, I do permutations of the variables. You know, if I, if I C gamma alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, it's the same thing as C gamma alpha 2, alpha 1, alpha 3, etc. Or you can see it in the DOZZ formula. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's something which is permute. I mean, the, 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 if I do a permutation, okay, if I take a permutation, of course I have that DOZZ or the three point correlation function we've constructed, of course, it, it doesn't depend on the permutation, okay? So, so take a permutation sigma, it's, it's invariant by, by changing my, the, the coordinates. Uh, sorry, there's, a, there's not a minus here. So does this use the fact that uh, any three points are conformally equivalent, so it would not be obviously two for higher number? No, no, it's it's going to work. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you mean this this permutation? Uh, no, no, we're going to see that. Uh, Is it a matter of permutation symmetry or uh, the fact that? No, it's a, it's a conformal invariance. It's, it's a conformal invariance too. So if you have, a, so okay, so DOZZ is the unique solution in some of this and these two shift equations. So if I prove that my three-point correlation function satisfies these two shift equations and this, I'm done. And it's because of a theorem, and that's what's uh, funny about this story. It's, it goes back to Liouville theorem uh, a long time ago, uh, as I'm going to explain. So imagine I show that this guy satisfies permutation invariance in the two shift equations. So what do I do? I fix alpha 2, alpha 3, and I look at this function. I look at the ratio, say, of DOZZ divided by my three-point correlation function, okay? And so this function here, well, since they satisfy the same shift equations, well, so I, 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 I suppose my three-point satisfies these two shift equations. Well, this means that this function, it has two periods, right? Okay, and, and so it also has this period, 2 over gamma. So I have a function which has two periods. Now here I have to make an assumption. I'm going to suppose, and this, you know, is, is something that people are... Uh, you know, know in the conformal field theory business is there's a difference between when the central charge is a rational number and not a rational number. So if I want my argument to work, I first have to suppose that gamma squared does not belong 
to the rationals. Okay? Because essentially what, what I'm saying in the, is that these shift equations, they don't uniquely characterize your, 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 your three-point function if gamma squared is a, a, a rational number. It, I, it hasn't appeared in these lectures, but let me just mention that the central charge of Uville is 1 plus 6 Q squared. So if I write Q, that's gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma. And so you see if this guy is rational, central charge is rational. And uh, so we suppose this, and then we can deduce the general case by a continuity argument, because everything we're doing is continuous in gamma. So if we suppose this, then by Liouville's theorem, I have a function which has two periods, and the ratio of the, of the periods is irrational. So it means that it's a constant function. Okay? And of course, the constant a priori depends on alpha 2 and alpha 3. But then I do the same thing. I look at this constant, which depends on alpha 2, alpha 3. By permutation invariance, it's going to have a shift equation in the, second in the alpha 2 variable. So it's a constant which only depends on the third variable. And then I do the same thing, and then at the end, I get that this constant, in fact, doesn't depend on any variable. You don't really need to repeat the argument. It's symmetrical, so it's constant with respect to one and constant with respect to the other. Well, okay, yeah, that's, but it's basically what I'm, okay, what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, you know, you, you just repeat the argument on, on each variable. Okay, and then at the end I get a constant. And so all I have to do is find the constant, and if, you know, there are lots of, you know, values you can take to identify the constant and at the end you you, you find one and uh, because I put a two here <laughs> because if there was a four then it would be two times d of zz okay so that's the idea of the proof so the question is how do you prove that the three-point correlation function satisfies these two shift equations which uniquely characterize it? now I must say that okay uh, when, 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 when DOZZ first uh, derived their formula for the three-point question in Uville, you know, it was really a, um, it was really a, a even in the physics standards, it, it wasn't very, you know, it wasn't considered rigorous. And I, I, I wrote to you a citation on this DOZZ formula. Um, yeah, so Zamorochikov, Zamorochikov, they said, okay, it, so they're talking about their derivation of DOZZ. They say, it should be stressed that the arguments of this section have nothing to do with the derivation. These are rather some motivations, and we consider the expression proposed to the DOZZ formula as a guess, which we try to support in the subsequent sections. So, you know, they, I, I showed how they derived it in the first lecture, and they, it was really about doing some analytic continuation guess. And so soon after the, the, the derivation, physicists, they were looking for a, uh, let's say, a, a, a more convincing derivation. And let me say that, uh, okay, uh, uh, some of our work is, 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 of, is inspired by, by a beautiful idea by, by Jörg Teschner. So soon after DOZZ, Teschner, he, in the conformal bootstrap approach, he explained how, in some sense, using four point, special four-point correlation functions, we can recover these two shift equations, okay? So Teschner was working in the, uh, with axioms of the conformal bootstrap. So basically, he was saying, okay, if Liouville theory exists, it's going to satisfy axioms. And if I gather all these axioms, at the end, the three-point correlation function should satisfy these two shift equations, and so it, it has to be DOZZ. So uh, on our side, what is difficult is we, we actually have to, and this is a kind of our program, we have to implement rigorously in a probabilistic setting all these axioms that physicists, you know, suppose in the bootstrap approach. And so, um, and so this is what I'm going to try to explain uh, uh, in the rest of these lectures, is, is how somehow we're, we're going to build all the axioms of the conformal bootstrap in some sense uh, with our probabilistic expression. And then at the end, uh, we're going to be able to derive these two shift equations. Okay. But, okay, the, the problem is, uh, and it's still an open program, there are lots of axioms of the bootstrap that we do not know how to justify from probability theory. And so what I'm going to do today 
is I'm going to focus on trying to explain to you how we get this equation here. So this equation is based on, so the proof of DOZZ, to summarize a bit, it's based on two papers uh, that we did with uh, Antti Kupienen and Rémi Rod. So uh, let me call the first paper KRD1. So in this thing, we, we derive what are called the BPZ equations. So we, we kind of set all the stage of, of the conform, you know, we, we re reveal somehow all the conformal structure behind our probabilistic construction. And, and as an application, we prove, so let me call this shift equation one. So S1, shift equation one. This is shift equation two. And in the second paper called the uh, integrability of, uh, of Liouville, uh, proof of the DOZZ formula, we show, we s and so here we saw shift equation one. And in this paper, is focused on showing shift equation two. So I will not discuss in these lectures shift equation two. It's much more complicated to derive rigorously. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's why it's a separate paper, it's because uh, there are, in, you know, there are lots of, it's really, this is really a technical paper. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm going to put under the rug all the technical difficulties in, in deriving this one. But I'm going to try today to, to show you how we can show shift equation one, okay? So that's the plan. So shift equation two will not be a BPC equation? It will, but the problem is, as I'm going to explain in, in, in the sequel, there are two ingredients. You have to use the BPZ equations for degenerate field insertions, and then you, you, you need to do operator product expansions rigorously. So you need to do Taylor expansions on your correlation functions, and the Taylor expansions are, are, are okay, rather, uh, rather nice in this case, but if you want to do Taylor expansions with the second BPZ equation, it's much more involved. And, and this is also where, you know, the, the two-point function appears, and, but I don't have time to explain. So I'm really going to explain this part of, of the proof today. So the first of the two papers uh, which, uh, which establishes the DOZZ. Okay. So uh, I'm, going to, uh, uh, I'm going to replace this expression for the general endpoint correlation function by the four-point correlation function because I'm going to be working with the four-point correlation function. So the idea, as I said in lecture one, is I'm going to take special four-point correlation functions which are going to satisfy differential equations and, and I'm going to try to use them to get information on the three-point correlation functions. That's the idea. It's So let me, let me introduce the four point. So I can, so I'm going to replace this thing. I'm just going to take four points in this thing here, but with one at infinity. So you know, I can, so I, so I'm going to take so alpha zero, say, and I, I'm going to look at a four-point correlation function with weights. Alpha zero, so uh, the first variable, I'm going to call it z zero. Well, z actually. And I'm going to define, so g alpha zero, z, the four-point correlation function with one point at infinity. So I take my expression. and I get a four-point correlation function with a point at infinity, and I get an explicit expression, okay, using my, 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 I get the following expression, so let me not write it. It's, so it's one over z, uh, yeah, alpha zero, alpha one, one over z minus one, alpha zero, alpha two. Okay, so the trivial part, um, so there's a two, mu to the minus uh, alpha zero plus alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three minus two q over gamma, the gamma function. So usually I call this S. And 
and some so I'm sticking uh, sticking so to the notations of my to my lecture notes I call this so this is a random variable and what is this random variable well this. Gamma for zero, so two, and I integrate against my my free field measure, my uh, my exponential free field volume. Measure. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm just writing with four points, essentially what I wrote with n. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to call this piece. Th so this is kind of a trivial piece. Okay, this this thing here. I'm going to call this piece. Oh, well, my notation. Tau alpha zero of z. In the standard variable, do you take absolute values or the complex values? Ah, no. So uh, okay, I, I, I should uh, I should have maybe recalled this. Uh, our probabilistic constructions uh, in all these lectures, the, the, I take real alpha zeros. Okay, is that your question? Yeah, and also the absolute values. Uh, why would there be an absolute? There's no need. Yeah, now I'm just wondering about Herbert structure. Never mind. Okay. It's it's a, the, okay. Of course, the DOZZ is, val is valid for complex gammas alpha zeros. But by the probabilistic door where we're, we're trying to understand it, we we need to take real weights essentially. Okay. So so I introduce a four point correlation, and I think, and so so let me first start with a remark. You can notice that if I take z equals zero here, well, I get the three point correlation function. with, sorry, where I replace alpha 1 by alpha 1 plus alpha 0. So let me, let me put infinity here, so it's my other notation for the three point. So, so you see, uh, if, I, if I look at what happens, so this is the link. Okay, you're starting to see these shift equations arise because, you know, I, I essentially when I look at the, this function around the point zero, I, I, I'm starting to see the three-point correlation function, which I've shifted. Okay, so it is z one, then z again, and z three in the in the g your definition. Ah, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Excuse me. Zero. Sorry. What did I do? One. Okay, so this is the four-point correlation function with one free parameter, 0, 1, and infinity. And a trivial observation here, <laughs> just plug in the definition, you'll see I get the three-point correlation. Okay. Now what's the idea behind the proof? The idea is that for special values of alpha zero, which were predicted in physics, so, is that, so the two values alpha 0 equals minus gamma over 2 and minus 2 over gamma, this thing here, this tau alpha, should satisfy a PDE. It's called the insertion of a degenerate field. Okay. So for alpha 0, for alpha 0 belonging to the finite set minus gamma over 2 minus 2 over gamma, Okay, physicists expect, and it's in their bootstrap axioms, they expect that this tau here I introduced, so just the four-point correlation function where I've removed a, you know, a, a, a trivial function in front, it just should satisfy uh, a second-order uh, partial differential equation, which is the hypergeometric one. That's the second-order BPZ equation. And so what we proved in this paper, uh, the first one, is... is exactly that. 
So proposition, if you want. <coughs> if I take this, so, I ta so this is taking partial de derivative with respect to the complex variable. So I hope this is clear. That the partial derivative is, you know, this, sorry, uh, minus. I'm taking notations of, well, this guy, uh, so if alpha 0, uh, where am I going to write it? Alpha 0 belongs, okay, so I'm going to put my proposition here. So, it, so if alpha 0, if alpha 0 belongs, is one of these two values, then this correlation function satisfies a finite PDE, which is the hypergeometric one. So this is what we proved in, uh, in the first paper. So the, the BPZ and the dual BPZ equation. Okay. Now, Where A, B, and C, uh, are related, of course, to the coefficients. So it's kind of, you know, tedious, but let me write the full conditions very clearly on the board. So remember, so Q is 2 over gamma plus gamma over 2. OK. I think this is correct anyways. I mean, the important thing is to get the idea. OK, so I have this finite uh, PDE. And so uh, the interesting thing is now that, OK, this, this came uh, this one, one magic thing about this thing is that if what we proved also, so it's not very difficult, that difficult to prove, but is that if you take a real valued solution to this PD, it's a 1D space. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's a, uh, the, the solution space of this is one dimensional. Okay? So this means that my four point correlation function, it's a one, uh, it, it belongs, to, it satisfies this PD for these two values. And so I can completely characterize it because it's a 1D, 1D space. So let me describe the solutions. So the general solutions of this so, so remember I have so I have A, B, and C which are related to all the parameters of my theory. Um, so if I introduce the, hyp the hypergeometric functions, so usually the Gauss hypergeometric, I think they're called the Gauss hypergeometric functions. Okay, so remember this thing here. You know, uh, oh, I, uh, I hope I'm not going to mess it up, but I think it's something like, you know, you know factorial n, factorial with respect to b, set to the power, you know, something like this. Where these factorials, uh, it's a a plus one, a plus n minus one, I guess, something like that. Okay, so I, I introduced these, this hypergeometric function. I introduced the second one, and I'm going to describe my solution space. parameters well all the so real solutions to this guy is nothing uh, are, are given by so I can write tau of alpha 0 of Z is equal to lambda so this is the free parameter times my hypergeometric function 
squared plus my second hypergeometric function squared where this guy is a special, uh, this guy has, a, uh, has an explicit expression, OK? So this means, so let me, let me write this. Uh, uh, so let me write this special, this expression. So remember, A, B, C have these re special, these relations. Um, so if I say this guy's an R. I have this is equal to, so it's very, it's also here, uh, once again, rather complicated, so. <coughs> so for people who don't like formulas, I think this is not the right lecture. I mean, never mind the exact expressions, but so, okay, so to summarize, what did we prove? So we proved two things. Uh, we proved that tau satisfies these PDEs. And we also proved that the solution space of this, all, all real solutions of this PDE are given by lambda times a hypergeometric function squared. So this is the appearance of the conformal blocks of conformal field theory. Plus some coefficient here times the second hypergeometric solution squared, this one here. And the coefficient here is given by this, you know, this rather complicated uh, expression with gamma functions. So that's what we proved. So what, how does the proof go in some sense now? Well, of course, we know what lambda is uh, for tau of alpha 0. Because, OK, if I take z equals 0, this is 0, OK, because this is worth 0. And this is worth 1. So lambda is nothing but the value of the function taken uh, at z equals 0. And we know by our probabilistic expression what it is. It's this thing, so c gamma alpha 1 plus alpha alpha 2, alpha 3. So we, know, so we know this function, what it is now. So how do we prove, how are we going to prove this shift equation, right? Well, we're going to try to find a second expression for the coefficient lying in front of f plus z square. And this, S, this second expression is going to we're going to see, uh, oh, sorry, it's the other way around where, where it's written. Sorry. Uh, the, this, this guy is going to be lambda here. It's the value z equals 0. And, I, and, and you remember alpha 0 is worth minus gamma over 2, or minus 2 over gamma. And so lambda is nothing but this guy here. Now, I'm going to do what is called a, an op operator product expansion, or just a Taylor expansion in math to try to find a second expression for the coefficient lying in front of f plus z squared. And this second expression I'm going to get is going to, is going to make this guy appear. And then by unicity, this will give me a relation between this guy and this guy, which is nothing but this shift relation. I, I, I don't know if, I don't know if, it's, if, if, it, if it's clear, but uh, I, it's, 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 it, I'm, 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 what I'm trying to do is, is to, uh, to find two different expressions in front of this guy. And uh, by saying they're, by unicity they're equal, well, I'm, I'm, I get the, the shift up there. OK? So that's, that's, that's the program. So right now, uh, what I'm, I did, I did it is essentially for, uh, for, for alpha 0. I'm going to now focus on the case alpha 0 plus minus, uh, equals minus gamma over 2. So here in my. So now I'm going to focus on this. OK, so let me give you. This equation, right, the same as intention, I guess. 
Excuse me? The equation in the, the second order equation yes. is the same as the intention, right? Yes. Okay. So then the, the, the expense on hypergeometry, right? Also. So it's different. They what they do in physics is they they they. Uh, yeah, or, okay, but Teshner, what he does is what they do in physics is they, he supposes that the correlations they factorize in a conformal piece and, a, and a, 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 in a bar conformal. And then he says the two conformal blocks, I put them together. And, but we don't have these two independent, you know, holomorphic and, and, and okay. anti-holomorphic <laughs> part. We only have one PDE. And the fact is that what we say, what we prove, is that you don't need to do all these factorizations of holomorphic, anti-holomorphic parts because you, you have a unicity statement over there. These you, what, 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 what is, for instance, you know, uh, new is the fact to say that we, you, you see the conformal blocks appear just with a PDE. They are sufficient to show this unicity statement here, whereas physicists, they, they cut it into holomorphic onto holomorphic parts. So it means uh, the equation was exactly the same, right? No, because he's working with the the a straight D. He, he's working with a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part. Of course, he knows that physicists know, of course, that the, the, the real correlation function which I'm working with is going to satisfy this PD. But they work with holomorphic, anti-holomorphic. Okay. So, let me explain. <coughs> let me, so let me take out th this, equa this e uh, equation and just, because, okay, this leads to this, and this summarizes uh, all, all we need. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the proposition is, is the following. So I'm going to take alpha 0 equals minus gamma over 2. And uh, what I'm going to focus in the second hour of these lectures, I'm first going to state what I'm going to, to prove in the second hour of these lectures. If I take alpha 0 equals minus gamma over 2, then I can show the following. Okay, and sorry, and I'm going to suppose alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 is smaller than Q. Then I have this. And if I do a Taylor expansion of my correlation functions, well, what do I get when z equals 0? Where I, well, I said it. It's the three-point correlation function. This is trivial to prove. And I, I can prove this. So this is a proposition you want. So it's stated uh, not as a proposition, but it's relation 5.14 in the notes. So, so I have still have my relation here. So now I'm only going to work with alpha 0. It's worth minus gamma over 2. So I can a actually I can actually replace it here plus little o. So if you prefer the coefficient here is, so I'm, I'm looking at z to the power gamma q minus alpha 1. So this is a proposition I want to prove in the next hour of these lectures. So proposition. I have this Taylor expansion where b of alpha 1, or b of alpha, is minus mu pi, the race, the product of three L functions, so these gamma functions. Now you see, if I have this Taylor expansion, well, what happens when z goes to uh, 0 here? The first order term is going to be, uh, as I s it's going to be, lambda is this guy. And 
The second order term, when I do a, an asymptotic expansion, it's going to be lambda times this, times z to the power 2, 1 minus c. Okay, so this means, so this unicity statement on my partial differential equation, along with this proposition that I'm admitting, you know, right now, it implies, okay, so maybe I'm, Wait, what am I going to erase? I, I think I want to erase the DOZZ formula. Can I? Okay. I, I, I think I, I like it as much as you do, maybe even more, but I have to erase it. It's, So this means that B of alpha 1, by unicity, B of alpha 1, C gamma alpha 1 plus gamma over 2, alpha 2 alpha 3 is equal to C gamma, so this is lambda, times my complicated function, you know, alpha of alpha of okay so alpha 0 now is worth minus gamma over 2 now if i simplify everything i do all the algebra there are tons of gamma functions all over the place well this this relation is equivalent to shift equation 1 okay by just you know simplifying this guy with this guy and with all these gamma functions at the end you spend one page of algebra and, and you find that uh, you get shift equation one. Okay, so um, I think I'm, yeah, I'm going to take a, a break maybe in a minute or two and uh, I hope that, I hope that uh, you understand, okay, w never mind the formulas, just the general philosophy. The general philosophy is to combine the unicity on a PDE and identify the coefficients in two different manners. And combining the unicity statement, it implies a relation on the three-point correlation functions. And it gives shift equation one. And then what I'm not going to discuss is in, in these lectures, and then basically what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to look at alpha zero equals minus gamma over two, but I can also do the thing with two over gamma, do a, use a unicity statement in the PDE, do Taylor expansions and identify the coefficient in two different ways. And it leads to a second shift equation. And then I'm, it characterizes the uh, DOZZ. Okay, so two minute break. Uh, okay, uh, just following questions, I, I, I'm just going to say again what I said. Maybe it was, it was not clear. So I, I have a unicity or uniqueness. People told me I have to say uniqueness. Uh, I have a uniqueness statement on my partial differential equation. So this is really analysis, if you want, which says that tau minus gamma over 2 of z, okay, I wrote, I wrote over there unique, the uniqueness statement on the PD. And this uniqueness statement says that tau of the z variable, so this is a, the t is a tau, in fact, it's a, or a minus gamma over 2z, it's nothing but the three-point correlation function where I replaced alpha 1 by alpha 1 minus gamma over 2, the first hypergeometric function squared, plus the same three-point correlation function times this ratio of gamma functions times the second hypergeometric function squared. So this second hypergeometric function, in fact, it's, it's not the hypergeometric function per se, it's times z to some power. And so, as a straightforward corollary of this uniqueness statement, I get that when z goes to zero, I have this Taylor expansion, is that this function, this four-point correlation function, is the three-point plus, so the same three-point times the coefficient, z to the power two, one minus c, plus little o of z to the power two, one minus c. So now, what I do is I try to derive this expansion directly in a probabilistic setting, 
and I find this proposition, star, say, and this proposition I'm going to prove now in the next hour, says that when I do an asymptotic expansion around zero, I get the three-point correlation function with shift minus gamma over two, plus the three-point correlation function, but with shift plus gamma over two instead of minus gamma over two, times an explicit function, and you'll see where this comes from, plus little o. So by unicity of a Taylor expansion, the coefficient that is here is nothing but the same thing as the coefficient that is here. And so this leads to this relation. And if you do the algebra and you're a bit patient, it's exactly equivalent to shift equation S1 up there. Okay. So that's, that was the idea. I, 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 want, I hope that it's rather clear what's going on. Okay. So it's really playing with partial differential equations and look at what happens at the boundary of their, you know, their domain of definition. So the, here it's z equals zero. It's, you know, it's not really defined, and you do, tell, uh, you do. I mean, you do. It is defined, sorry, and you you look at what happens uh, around special point star. All right. So to so now, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, prove this proposition that I can do this Taylor expansion. Excuse me. Uh, so just the fact that tau satisfies the the PDE that's easy to show. No, that's uh, not easy to show. It's uh, it's 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 no, it's not easy. It's 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 rather what essentially what you do is Gaussian integration by parts because you have some kind of Gaussian structure behind your your definition, right? It's the correlation. It's nothing but the expectation of you know. So z the variables here, but this is the exponential of the free field. So you can do lots of Gaussian integration by parts. But the problem is you have lots of divergences. And so it applies, uh, you know, introducing Berling transforms. So it's a mixture of, esti you know, probabilistic estimates and, and complex analysis tools I, I, under the rug. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really one of the big parts of our first paper is to show these PDEs are true. But I have to choose what I'm going to, you know, to present. So I don't want to present how we derive the partial differential equation. It's, 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 it's rather technical, and there's lots of uh, tricks involved. Uh, rather, I, I, I want to emphasize uh, you know, the, 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 the general scheme behind the proof. But in a way, it's known because there are de de degenerate fields in the CFT parlance, right? So what, what corresponds to that knowledge in the Gaussian approach? Where do you, how do you see it? Well, you see it, it's the same, same, same thing I'm going to say to Pascal is essentially um, you, you start taking, uh, taking derivatives, you do integration by parts, and at the end you see that there's only special values, uh, well, the two special values that I wrote, so minus gamma over 2, minus 2 over gamma, where the, the terms cancel miraculously. And uh, you, you, somehow you have faith in conformal field theory, and you believe you've constructed... Yeah, and you believe you have the right probabilistic definition. You believe it, and then you say, okay, if I, if I use the Gaussian structure, I should see these, these PDEs. But in a way, if you had not known that it should work, yeah. it would have been difficult to spot, right? Yeah. Starting from but That's why our, our projects, somehow, it's kind of, of course, it's inspired by, by what physicists did. You, it's, you're importing this bootstrap language into probability. Oh, yes, of course, it's difficult to spot. I mean, why would it? Why would it work? I mean, I mean, when you look at this expression, how can you guess that these two special values are going to work? In SLE, in SLE you know, you, reco you recover all the BTZ equations from the, On the properties of yeah. you know, the SLE. So, anyway, so, but here it's somehow more difficult to spot from the start. It's, it's, uh, yes, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of difficult to, 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 but somehow this is what, you know, I, uh, my student, Pitunan Zhu, is working on, is, is trying to, kind of, you know, exactly kind of uh, identify what kind of structure, probabilistic structure is behind the fact that you have all these BPZ equations. It's, but uh, it's kind of, uh, it's still a bit mysterious for us, but I think that Tunan is doing progress on this. <coughs> yeah, well, we're not yet there. <laughs> okay, so. Let me, let me prove, uh, so this is now I'm, I'm going to jump for one hour into 
pure probability. Okay, okay so uh, maybe uh, I'm going to erase, uh, well, I can erase nearly everything. I'm so I'm going to erase the shift equations which determine DOZZ. Okay. I don't really need these anymore. All right. So. Okay, and so, as I said, so though I can work in the dual case, I'm not going to do it in, in these lectures, so everywhere I'm going to replace alpha zero by minus gamma over two. So everywhere, put minus gamma over two. It's a bit long, but I'm, I'm doing it professionally. Gamma over two, minus gamma over two, and so R, my random variable, which I'm taking the expectation. Um, I'm going to say that it's so alpha one plus alpha two. So this is alpha bar in my notation. So minus gamma over two, and here. Well, I have x minus z to the power gamma square over 2. Okay. So this is my, I replaced, uh, theoretically, I think I managed to, <laughs> to replace all the alpha zeros by minus gamma over 2. Okay, and let me, let me put some, some notation so it's going to be clear. So I'm going to set, so if you look at my, my random variable is the integral over C of some kernel, which depends on z and x, times the exponential of the free field. And so notations of the lectures. And, 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 and this kernel is, I'm just copying to, to make some room. The kernel is just this guy here. Okay, so it's x minus z to the power gamma squared over 2 x plus gamma alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 minus gamma over 2 divided by x to the power gamma, power gamma alpha 2. All right. Okay. So the idea is that my tau here, so let me put another notation so it's it's usually what I call S, but it's 1 over gamma, alpha 1 minus gamma over 2 minus 2Q. Two okay? And so what is tau? So tau minus gamma over 2Z with my notations. I'm just rewriting to get things, uh, you know, uh, it's mu, so to the power minus p, I think, or p. Um, I, can, I can work this out. I, yeah, minus p, yeah, sorry. Gamma of p, so with my notation. Expectation of r minus gamma over 2z to the power minus p. This is my four-point correlation function. Okay, so this board is, is set into stone. These are my notations in this hour. Okay, I just re I'm just rewriting what I wrote already lots of times. It's a four-point correlation function. It's mu to some power, gamma of p, the, the expectation of this variable. When z and so I have to study what's going on when z goes to zero. So of course when uh, and of course I have r minus gamma over two z. For z equals zero, <coughs> it gives me um, okay. Okay. 
Now, so right now, forget about this term and this term, okay? They're fixed in my problem, so. So I have to study this. So it's reasonable to write this, right? Expectation. So I, the first order term is, 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 is given by this, and if you take this moment to the power minus p, et cetera, I get, of course, the three-point correlation function with minus gamma over two shift. Now, what I want to do is go to the step after. So it's completely logical what I'm going to do. I'm going to write this. Minus, so if I want to study tau, I just have to study this moment. Well, I mean, it's not always true, but here it works. It's reasonable to, to start by doing this. Minus p, expectation of r minus gamma over 2z minus r minus gamma over 2, 0. my random variable taken, so I'm just taking the derivative. Okay. So, of course, if this guy is getting close to this guy, then I should get this as an expansion. So I think everyone agrees with that. Okay, now, what is this guy? Okay, let me... I'm going to do it in steps. So what is this guy and this guy? It's just the integral of some kernel with respect to the exponential of the free field. So it's nothing but minus p expectation of the integral over c kz of x minus k0 of x, my free field, my exponential free field, sorry, times r minus gamma over 2, 0, is taken at the point 0, to the power minus p minus 1. Now I use Fubini to take this integral out, integral over c. Uh, um, no, I, I, I think I can erase uh, this board too because I recast the notations. What is this? This is minus p expectation of, sorry, the, the integral comes out. The integral over c, kz of x minus kz of 0, okay? Expectation of my m gamma t to x, so I'm going to write it explicitly, okay? Out. So exponential gamma x of x minus gamma square over 2. So I'm writing my, my measure explicitly. The exponential of the Gaussian free field renormalized times, so let me write it. Uh, uh, so what is R0? It's nothing but the kernel integrated against, okay, uh, if I write it in, maybe in, in, in uh, I'm going to call this variable u now, so I can match the, because I already have my variable x here. And let me write it completely, uh, my m gamma is the exponential of the free field. to the power minus p minus 1. So I have this expression. Roughly, the difference between the, the value in z and at 0, it's, it's, it's this thing here where I, I integrate against this guy here. Now, 
Now here I'm going to use uh, Gersonov's theorem. Gersonov's theorem says that if I take the exponential of a Gaussian variable, uh, and uh, so this, so let me let me recall Gersonov. Okay, it says that if I look at some function of the, so imagine I take a, a Gaussian variable. Okay. So when I when I look at this, this is expectation one. This is a chi. This has expectation one, so it's just a change of probability measure. And if I look under this probability measure, a function of my Gaussian free field. Okay. So you've seen this lots of times. Well, this thing is the same thing as this. It's the same. It's the free field that I shift by a deterministic function, which is in each point x, the function is worth the covariance of my free field at point x with the Gaussian variable. So I think everyone, this is in the, the these are, this is in the lecture notes. The Gersonov theorem. Okay, so I really stated it. So here, Okay, I'm doing this formally, but if you want to make what I'm doing rigorous, it's not complicated. You just work with cutoffs of your Gaussian free field everywhere, and you're allowed to take the exponential of the free field. Uh, and then you do everything I'm doing, and then you make the cutoff go to zero. So what I'm doing at a kind of formal level, because this is not defined point-wise, you know, it's, it works the same. Uh, you just have to, to regularize x everywhere, say, use Gersonov, and then go to the limit. So I apply Gersonov, and this is, this is where you see how the minus gamma over 2 is going to become minus gamma over 2 plus gamma, and so plus gamma over 2, how this guy is appearing. This is nothing but alpha 1 minus gamma over 2 plus gamma, and it comes from Gersonov. So I'm now going to erase. So, so I apply Gersonov. And what do I get? I get that this thing is minus p integral over c kz of u minus kz of 0. Oh, am I? Sorry, I, I think I'm wrong. Um, sorry, I'm 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 integrating on the u variable, and I'm like letting z go to zero. Okay, that's this is correct. Minus k zero of u times so a function of u. where I applied Gersonov. So what is f of u? f of u is equal to the integral of k0 of x, exponential gamma square, uh, this guy here, uh, Uh, sorry, there's an expectation, of course, uh, everywhere. So, okay. So I apply Gersonov, and it it just amounts to shifting the free field. So exponential gamma x becomes exponential gamma x plus the shift due to the covariance. Minus p minus one, and f of u equal to this. Okay, so. Now you're starting to, to look rather well, because if u is worth 0 here, then you're going to see that it corresponds to, putting, uh, to adding gamma to your, to your alpha 1 minus gamma over 2, and so it creates alpha 1 plus gamma over 2. Also, another remark is p plus 1. What is it? Well, it's 1 over gamma 
alpha 1 minus gamma over 2 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 minus 2q plus 1. And so I, I write 1 as gamma over gamma, and that makes me 1 over gamma, alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 plus alpha plus alpha 3 minus 2q. So you see, uh, Gersonov is, is going to create a log singularity of power gamma, which is going to add with the log singularity of power alpha 1 minus gamma over 2 to create alpha 1 plus gamma over 2. And you see it also at the level of the power here, because remember, the alphas, they appear in the power and in the log singularity. You're integrating in, in Newville. OK, so what I have to do now is state a, a theorem, which is uh, um, which is uh, uh, to study this integral when z goes to 0. And everything concentrates around the value u equals 0. So here's a lemma. The lemma is the following. So if I take a, a continuous function, say f, whatever the function, uh, I'll apply it to the problem I have it at hand here. But it says the following. The lemma says that if I take, so let me write it. Uh, let me write uh, the explicit definition here of the kernels. So I'm just copying what's upstairs. So if I take u minus z to the power gamma square over two um, minus u gamma square over two u plus gamma okay alpha one plus alpha two. Plus over 2 divided by u to the power gamma alpha 1, 1 minus u gamma alpha 2. I take any function f, so continuous function, that I integrate. When z goes to 0, so it goes to 0, of course, it's equivalent when z goes to 0 to z to the power gamma q minus alpha 1, okay, where q is 2 over gamma plus gamma over 2, times f of 0 times pi divided by what I want. So this is a purely deterministic lemma I'm, I'm, I'm stating. Okay, so this is this is just this is analysis, uh, regular analysis. Where I have this thing where L is. Remember my L function. L of Z is the ratio of two gamma functions. Okay. What do you mean? It's a distribution. Yes, you you pick up the value. Uh, well, I, there's no need to speak of distrib. Oh, yeah, you mean it concentrates around zero with it. Yes, yes, if you want it. Uh. Okay, so let me admit this lemma for a while, just to, to, to conclude my proof. So this means that when z goes to zero, uh, let me finish. Well, this means that with my problem at hand, I'm equal, I'm, I'm going to be roughly equal to minus p z to the power uh, gamma q minus alpha 1 uh, times f of 0. So if, if, if you do, if you look at f of 0, what is f of 0 in my problem? Well, it's the integral of x plus. So I just plug in this I just plug in my value here. Okay, in zero. This if u equals zero, this is one minus x for u equals zero. This is log of one over x plus log x plus. Okay, the covariance of my Gaussian free field. And so if I if I do the algebra well, I get alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 
divided by x gamma alpha 1 plus gamma over 2, 1 minus x gamma alpha 2. minus p minus 1. OK. Now, if I work at the level of tau, this means that I find that, that the, min the p here now, I, I, I worked with, I did the asymptotic expansion on this guy. OK. So now if I look at my tau function, well, I can see that the p goes with gamma of p, and it creates gamma p, of p plus 1. And uh, there's also a mu hanging, uh, which, which I don't see in my expression here. But I write mu minus p as mu minus p minus 1 times mu. And at the end, I get the, exp the, the expression I, I gave you in the beginning. Okay, So uh, tau minus gamma over 2z is roughly, so my correlation function like this, minus, so p gamma p which becomes gamma p plus 1, and uh, mu minus p minus 1 times uh, this expectation times pi mu over these functions. And I get my, I've derived my asymptotic expansion. one over two. And so this is nothing but, uh, so there's a minus here. And gamma p plus one, mu minus p minus one. There's a two also everywhere I forget, okay. Yeah. Oh, there's an error up there. There's a two missing, but never mind the two. It's, it's a pain. So this guy is going to give me my, my, my three-point correlation function. So this guy is going to be this guy comes here, and I get C gamma alpha 1 plus gamma over 2. OK, so I hope this, this is clear. The, the idea is that, OK, <laughs> let me be rigorous. There's a 2 here. Um, I hope. You know, I forget the 2 once, once in a while. No, it's OK. I also think that I forgot. I'm sorry about these things, but I think I also forgot there's a gamma minus 1. But they're global constants. I always, I always forget these guys, but they play no role. I mean, they're just global constants. OK, so uh, all I have to do, if I want to conclude, um, is I have to prove this lemma here and see the, the gamma functions uh, arrive. So that's not very difficult. To, that's so I wanted to give you one case in f kind of full detail. That's, that's what I decided to do today. Uh, lemma, this thing here, well, it's going to concentrate around 0. When z goes to 0, the mass here is going to concentrate around 0. So well, when z is going to 0, this is roughly the integral, let's say, for u less or equal to, OK. It's going to concentrate around 0, so this guy is 1. It doesn't play a role. So I'm just going to look at this case. F of u. And so what do you do here? Well, you, do, you just do a, cha a standard change of variable. Okay. You set uh, u equals zy. So with a, a norm here. And what you get, 
Well, by, by simple scaling with this guy and this guy and this guy, you see, so I'm going to write explicitly what you get. You get gamma Q minus alpha 1. So I, I wrote Q explicitly. Times, so this is a simple scaling. Well, y minus z over z power gamma square over 2 minus y gamma square over 2 y gamma alpha 1 f of z y Okay, and so now you, I think you get it. When z goes to 0, this goes to f of 0. This thing, it's the maximum of z, y, and 1. So of course, when uh, to the power 4. So when you z goes to 0, the maximum goes to 1. So this goes to 1, this goes to f to 0. And then at the end, I'm equivalent to z to the power of gamma, so q, f of 0 times, well, this integral here. And luckily, these kinds of integrals, of course, were computed by people like, uh, so z over z bar is something that's isotropic, so you just put 1 if you want here, okay? And of course, it's it's not really a, it's not, it's not, it's not by pure coincidence that these kinds of integrals were computed by by people like Fatayev. And uh, well, Fatayev computed this integral. I think it's due to him. Maybe it's due to mathematicians before. I, I don't know. But this integral, it's exactly equal to this. So you're really happy. You do your little expansion. At the end, you have this this thing, and then you spend a few days looking in books. What is this worth? And at the end, if you find the right book, you see that it's exactly equal to that guy upstairs. Excuse me? Uh, doesn't Mathematica or Maple know these integrals? Perhaps, yeah. I, I don't know. I, 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 okay, you, you, you say I, I've lost lots of time looking at what this is worth. Uh, I, I, yeah, next time I, we have lots of these in our business, and next time we go see you, we ask you, uh, Okay, so that, that's the, so, so, so you see, uh, let, me, let me conclude. I, I was able to, to, to do, sorry, the asymptotic expansion around z goes to 0 plus, you know, what I, what I you know, the three-point correlation function with, with the right shift. Uh, so let me conclude uh, what I did. I think it's minus mu pi. Yeah, this is, I think it's in Selberg, yeah. So I, I showed that when z goes to 0, I get this minus mu pi over, you know, these, these ratio of gamma functions. And so, and I did this. So, I did this under this condition. Okay, there's another one. I don't. I'm putting under the rug. But essentially, I did it under this condition. Remember, because uh, what happens is when I use Gersonov and everything, I end up with Uville, but with a singularity around 0, which is not alpha 1 minus gamma over 2, but alpha 1 plus gamma over 2. And if you recall things, the Seiberg bounds, the extended Seiberg bounds, were only able to define Uville conformal field theory provided the alphas are smaller than Q. And so I need this condition for what I'm doing to work. Okay, because if this condition is not true, then this is bigger than Q, 
And in fact, these guys are going to be infinity. What happens if you sit exactly at Q? Uh, you should get maybe a, a log uh, correction. There is no way you can. Oh, you can do it at alpha equal Q, I think. No, that's OK. No, the real problem is what happens uh, when alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 is bigger than Q. OK, so this concludes what I wanted to say today. So I, I really wanted to go uh, through full detail on, on, on these matters. So I have <coughs> a bit of time left. So I, I, I'm going to, uh, it's. C can I ask a question? Mm. Um, so all of your calculations in these four lectures depended very much on the choice of the background metric? No, n n nothing depends on the background metric. Well, it was, it had this similar form, right? Technically, yes. Oh, you mean I did everything with a background metric? You mean so this plus. Uh, oh, yeah, but look, 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 look. If, if, imagine I have any background metric. Well, so remember my metric was this. What happens if I take any metric? Well, I mean, up to some constant, this thing goes to g of 0. I mean, all these conclusions, they, you, you, the metric never plays a role in everything in Uvel. Of course, I, I could have wrote everything with a, a, a yeah? Where would it? Yeah, I mean, OK. Also, OK, in some sense, when you do Gersanov and everything, the, the background metric plays, but it's only everything simplifies. I mean, really, it's, it's really a, a, you, up to a global constant called the veil anomaly, there is no issue with metrics. Metri the pr metric plays no role at all. I, I know what you would expect, but just. But here's an illustration. Relations, it's not very transparent. Yeah, OK, but here's an illustration. This coefficient here, it's really universal, you know, I mean, this, I mean, the new veil. It doesn't depend on the background metric, and you can see it up to a constant. When you, I mean, when you do these kind of fusions, these are called, uh, you know, these OPEs, you, you, you're, you're really zooming around a point, so the metric becomes flat, if you want. You don't see it. And this is an illustration. What makes this, the problem much more complicated for the other value, minus 2 over the So, OK, let me. So let me spend 10 minutes uh, to conclude. Uh, so what, what is complicated? OK. What is complicated is, is the following thing. So I'm not at all going to explain. There are some explanations in, in the lecture notes, but it, it took us a while to, to really do all this rigorously. The real difficulty. Really what's difficult when you're doing these and all what I said fails is when I look at the case alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 bigger than Q. And when I look at 2 over gamma, well, if I, I look at my parameters, I'm always in the case, OK, I'm, I'm always in the case, no, bigger than Q. Excuse me? You are smaller than Q. Yes, but what I'm saying now is what I, 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 what I did in detail today is I showed how you do a rigorous OPE, a rigorous Taylor expansion in this case. And now what is difficult, and that's our second paper, I mean, what it took us, you know, lots of technical details in here, what took us some time to really understand and do properly is to do Taylor expansions when I have this condition. And when I'm looking at the other insertion, the dual uh, BPZ equation, I'm necessarily what happens is uh, I, I don't shift with gamma over 2, but with 2 over gamma. And I'm always in this case, in fact. So what I have to, I mean, what we have to understand is what happens when I'm in this situation. And then you just copy, basically, this case to this case for 2 over gamma. But the crucial point is, well, how do I do an expansion? Uh, because this fails, right? Because at the end, I get, I get something that doesn't exist. And also, this integral here, you can see that it explodes, in fact. So, well, in words, well, you 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 look at, you look at what happens. Uh, you you look at how this variable. Okay, you look at what happens to this variable when z goes to zero. Yeah, how it blows up, and so you. 
you, you analyze the guy around z equals zero, and what enters the, day, the, the game is the tail expansion of, of my, 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 my GMC, uh, my Gaussian chaos measure, and the tail expansion of this, of the GMC around the point, it's given by the reflection coefficient of Uville, you know, the partition function of your, your theory. And so you need really to analyze, so roughly what happens, so it's in the notes, but I, I, I can't, but I, I, can, I, can, I can state the, the proposition. So if alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 is bigger than Q, then, okay, let me write it. Then, we, so proposition, this is a proposition we prove. So let me write it clean. Proposition. So imagine alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 is bigger than Q. Then we can derive that tau of minus gamma over 2z, the Taylor expansion is that my four-point correlation function gives me the same order zero term. That's easy. Plus r alpha 1, c 2q minus alpha 1 minus gamma over 2, alpha 2, alpha 3, z to the power gamma q minus alpha 1 plus little l. Now the idea, so this is the lecture 2. This is the two-point correlation function of, 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 of Uville uh, field theory. And it's it's, it's the t and you see what is called, kind of starting to arise, what is called the reflection principle. Namely that what replaces alpha 1 plus gamma over 2, which I do not know how to define probabilistically. Okay? Well, y you see that you should replace it by some kind of, you know, reflection of your, your alpha 1 plus gamma over 2 times a coefficient, which is called the reflection for that reason, in fact. Now, uh, what you can... what so how does this come in the game? It's because essentially when you're looking at Taylor expansions, you want to understand when z goes to zero what this variable is looking like. And so you have to analyze what's going on, say, around the singularity when z is going to zero. So you want to look at your kernel okay, around this singularity. And, okay, it's, you can show, it, 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 it demands some, uh, an amount of work, you can show that this variable somehow, you know, it, it, it's something which is scale invariant times a Gaussian chaos with a singularity, and then you have to analyze, you know, really precisely the tail behavior of this. And the tail behavior of this, we know it's ruled by the reflection coefficient. That was lecture two. And at the end, you can show this. And if you do this, you're not done at all. And then I'm going to conclude. And so I, I, I'm putting this, so here I'm telling you in five minutes all the difficulties. So once you get here, you have to show, in fact, another thing. You have to show that this is the same thing as this. Minus mu pi. So, okay, this is going to be vague, but it's the last 10 minutes, so it's just to give you a flavor of what's going on. Times R. Okay, so... So you see what comes out of the probabilistic uh, expansion is this thing. And what we show is that we, this probabilistic expression, we first have to show that it's equal, that, that there are shift equations which wor work also with the two-point correlation function of Uva. And so by working you know, with tricks on using symmetry, we're able to show that this guy is worth this guy. And then we have really the reflection coefficient which is working. And so this means somehow that this guy, it's nothing but the analytic continuation of this function. So wh what we prove is 
that if you want to analytically continue the, the correlation functions beyond the Seiberg bound, alpha bigger than Q, well, you, sh you, should re you should replace this by R alpha. So we show that this thing is analytic. Okay, so if I take, sorry, if I take this thing for alpha less than Q and this definition for alpha bigger than Q, this is an analytic function. So somehow what we do is we show that this thing is analytic, that the reflection coefficient is the right uh, way to extend the probabilistic definition because we, we don't have no idea how to extend it. But then by working with these equations, we're able to show that, okay, by, uh, that this thing is analytic. And so we can analytically continue the three-point everywhere. And once we show that R, yeah, it, it satisfies the right shift equations, we see that this is nothing but, by definition, the three-point correlation function with this shift. And we do the same thing with 2 over gamma. And so with this, you know, this analytically continued three-point correlation function, we, can, we see also the reflection coefficient enter the game again. And you know, since it's always the same function, it's you know, these analytically continued three-point functions. At the end, we get the second shift equation. So OK, it's, it, it went a bit fast, but essentially the take-home <laughs> message is that if you want to understand you know, a Taylor expansion or, or, or Uville when you're putting a weight bigger than Q, these equations we get from the BPZ, they, they enable us to show that the right analytic continuation of Uville is, is, is given by reflecting the weight alpha in this manner and, uh, and multiplying by, by R of alpha. And on this analytically continued guys, we're able to show both shift equations and then conclude that they satisfy the DOZZ formula. Okay, so this was the uh, uh, last five minutes. It's probably vague, but I, I think I gave a fair amount of details in, 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 my, in my lecture notes, but it would be completely pointless to, to try in the last five or ten minutes to, to, to show you how, how the Taylor expansions work. Uh, there are lecture notes for that, and uh, I don't want to. I want you to have a good impression on these lectures, and I feel that the first hour today was uh, rather okay, simple to follow. And if I start doing this guy, try to show these expansions, it's going to be a mess in 10 minutes. So I think I'm going to conclude right here. Thank you.